Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Meet the Primates of Africa, and it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Richard DeGuvia. Richard, thank you so much for being here today and for bringing us another fabulous topic. Let's go ahead and just dive right in. Thank you, Sunny, and thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm really excited about chatting about this. Primates have become somewhat of my fun point and a lot of my trips and energy has gone into the great, great apes um, over the last few years and going forward. And I feel like every time I meet the great apes and even the monkeys, I get more and more enamored by their intelligence, by their sneakiness, by their joyfulness, by their playfulness, every part of them just screams, let's just sit down and watch you for a long time. So let's start with me. Although I'm definitely not the topic that needs to be worried about, but I'm a NADHAB expedition leader. I have led over a hundred treks through Uganda and Rwanda to the gorillas. Uh, for natural habitat, and it is a joy. So here's a little intro as to what I like and what I am like when I'm with these animals. So here we're waiting for the vice president. He's coming through right behind me here. Got a lot of spy ants around, so I'm not going to get eaten. Eat in the back here. Yeah? You can see him. And here he comes out. So this is the second in charge, vice president. And then there's a black back on its way through now. Oh, it's a female with a baby. Beautiful female with a baby. Look at the baby. Hello, little one. Hello, little one. That's ridiculous. So that's my love and my excitement and how I play in this whole thing. But the primates in general are very interesting because they're our closest relatives. In fact, we are a primate. And our evolution goes back a long, long way. In fact, the oldest known primate was a mammal, primate-like mammal, was found in North America. And there was another one found in China. And from those two is where they think that our primate lineages came through. So it's theorized that the early primates really flourished around Eurasia, so Europe and Asia around that area, and the lineage leading to the African apes and humans ourselves migrated south from Europe and around Asia and slowly moved down and changed over time. And this dates back about 47 million years. Now, our origins, though, are shrouded in mystery due to a lack of fossil evidence. And this here is the what is thought to be our common ancestor going back, that uh, oldest known like, mammal-like primate that was around North America. And within these things, you can see how our lineages started to move along. And what I'm going to do through this webinar is I'm going to discuss each of these little breakdowns, sometimes in a, a lot of information, but more towards our African trips and where we go and what we see out here, and move down through to our great apes, which sit down here. So primates effectively split into two groups. The first group ended up in Madagascar, and they're known as the lemurs. And we're going to talk in depth about them now, but they're very interesting because they're a branch unto their own, but still within the primate family. And then from there, we got torn in two from that split off. So your tarsiers, which are more towards your Asia side of things, 
they're in a group onto their own again on one side and you then have all the old world monkeys new world monkeys apes and humans that fall in the same category so that's the three basic splits that happened and if we go into lemurs when we go down that little shoot to the left which split off madagascar is a fascinating place because it broke off of africa 80 million years ago and it has never had a land bridge so anything that got there swam or flew or floated to get across to or to get across to that island and because of this real craziness lima started evolving probably about 40 to 52 million years ago so it's a long time ago and it's thought that the initial lemurs that went across which we think are our sportive lemurs so somewhere around these guys over here and our woolly lemurs they had the ability to hibernate in fact some of the woolly lemurs and sportive lemurs to date and the mouse lemurs actually go into hibernation and will hibernate through the winter time which is not all that cold but it's cold enough and unlike the bears and things that hibernate in the northern hemisphere what happens with them is they go into this torpor state and their body temperatures really drop down and they slow their functionality down these guys their temperatures are variable and your fat tailed dwarf lemur is the one that really does a great bit and he will expand his tail to 60% of his body mass will be fat in his tail to get him through his hibernation. And the thought behind all of this is that we may be able to use this for deep space travel to figure out or unlock our potential to be able to hibernate and to slow our systems down in order to get long distances through space to get to the other side. Now, if we look on the left here at this, crazy diagram you will see that as we break down into lemurs which are the blue lines over here you have your tarsiers which we spoke about earlier which went to the right hand side you have your new world monkeys old world monkeys apes bush babies and lorises which are still in africa and asia and then you have lemurs and they are just this crazy crazy speciation of lemurs in fact in the early in 1994 there were 33 recorded species and subspecies our scientific knowledge of dna and understanding has gone up so much that within a matter of 14 years so in 2008 there were over a hundred species we now have over 110 recorded species of lima throughout the the island of Madagascar and the island of Madagascar is fascinating on its own this is just the sport of lemurs that you find around here and you can see each of their specific home ranges with the colored dots that go around here and it's the perfect place to see evolution because Madagascar has been again separate for over 80 million years you had a mass extinction that went on and then it was repopulated by anything that could fly there swim there float there to get to this point and as each of these animals found a different spot they then speciated and started filling up niches that had occurred there and within an island like this there's a mountain range that runs down this little line that you can see of lemurs up top here in the high altitude rainforests and this is a mountain range that comes from here and up from the northeast up here we have storms hurricanes that come down uh, we call them cyclones because they turn the other way to what you guys have in the northern hemisphere and our cyclones come down and hit this coast so the east coast of madagascar is lush rainforest lots of rain lots of water different altitudes from sea level rainforest to mid altitude to high altitude rainforest but as soon as the air climbs over that mountain range, it slowly dries out. So the southwestern section down the bottom here is 
theoretically termed a desert for the amount of time that there's rainfall. But when these cyclones come through, there will still be some rainfall and you have this very unique environment called the spiny forests of Madagascar. And up in the northwest, up top here, is a very important space, especially for WWF, one of the uh, prime habitats for trying to save, is this uh, dry deciduous forest up at the top here. A lot of baobabs up at the top going around this area and all the way down this side. And where the speciation gets really crazy is just the fact that you think that you have 110 different types of lemurs split up into five extant families. There were originally seven different families of lemurs. So you have your lemuridae, which are your normal lemurs, your brown lemurs like this, uh, the bamboo lemurs, the greater bamboo lemur, and the woolly lemur over here. They fall within this lemuridae. They're just the normal guys. Then you get your lepi lemuridae, which are your sportive lemurs, which we've already looked at, your ring-tailed lemur like we have seen before. Um, we have our Indri day. Indri is the largest extant lemur. Probably stands about three feet off the ground. Really big, and it's got this very eerie call, which I'll play for you just now. And our black and white and rough lemurs all fall within that. Our cherry gallidae, which is our little mouse lemurs down here, and then our Dalbertonia day, which are our eye eyes. And where it gets interesting again is the fact that when these guys arrived, not everything had filled niches. So things have to find different things. So here's our, our little eye eye. It's a crazy looking little creature. This is a baby at the Duke Lima Center. And these guys have filled the niche of a woodpecker. And if you look at the fingers of these guys, it's like something out of a horror movie. And they've got this long extended middle finger, which has very sensitive nerve endings in it. And it has the ability to feel vibrations of insects within there. It will then use its teeth to bite through the wood and then stick that finger in and pull out grubs and eat them, filling this niche. So each of these guys had this opportunity to fill a niche that, that they wouldn't have normally had to do. You can see how big the ears are in order to hear and unfortunately for these guys, because of bad publicity and Madagascar is full of fatties like uh, folklore, and these guys are believed to bring death. So people kill them whenever they see them, and we're now trying to bring them back from the brink. We have our sea fuckers, which love to jump across different things. This is one at our last destination. Um, where you go for high tea and these guys all come out. And I'm really excited because we get back to Madagascar this year for the first time since uh, COVID started. So really psyched to get back to this beautiful place. Again, another brown lemur, one of the lemurs from Lima Island, where we actually have them popping onto our heads and we wear them like hats, which is pretty cool. The well-known ring-tailed lemurs, Again, these guys are beautiful just in the fact that they have the ability to be in the drier area. So they're on the brink going into that area. But their digestive systems need to be sparked up. So in the mornings, you'll see them doing a little meditation pose and putting sun on their bellies, which help warm themselves up in order to get this digestive system started. Where it gets crazy is there was a massive in, um, um, massive type of lima, which was Archeo Indris, and it was the size of a gorilla, which we'll talk about gorillas later on. But they were huge, and these guys lived here until man arrived. And man arrived about 3,000 to 2,000 years ago, and in that time, we have taken the available space for these beautiful creatures down to 10% of the island. And we wiped out a lot of these things. This was great meat. They didn't know what a human was. They did not know what a predator was that would worry them. They were just sitting ducks. So, and this goes all the way down to small little guys like this little Goodman's mouse lemur, which is about yay big. Just about two or three inches long, weighs only about 
one ounce, just over one ounce, where this big guy weighed around, sorry, this keeps jumping out, weighed around 350 to 440 pounds. So quite a large difference. So let's listen to what the injury injury sounds like. I love this call. It's kind of an eerie sound, and I hope my kids don't wake up now thinking we're being haunted or something like that. But it's this eerie sound, and when you're in the forest and this sound is ringing through as you're walking up, it's, it's quite, a, quite a thing to be present with. And these animals, again, because we have only started arriving sort of 3,000 to 2,000 years ago, the animals, they don't know that we're a danger. They'll run between your legs. They don't even think about you as a problem. So it's it's an amazing, amazing place to live. So that's the first leg on our idea of this whole thing. So this was our Lemuri forms, your Lemuri day and Loressi day down here. Now we're going to go and I'm going to skip the Tasi forms because they don't occur around Africa and we're going to keep going down to our two types of monkeys. Now if you understand old adage, the new world was founded by Christopher Columbus. When he crossed over the Atlantic and came across to the Americas, that was known as the new world, hence new world monkeys. And old world monkeys being Europe, Africa, and Asia, which were all connected and easily accessible for many, many years. And these two monkeys, barring the uh great ape side of things um they have differences so our old world monkeys are africa and asia new world monkeys were america body size small to uh, medium to large on the old world monkeys whereas our new world monkeys can go from tiny little monkeys through to medium noses are different downward facing nostrils um, on our old world monkeys, where the new world monkeys had a flatter face, flat nose, and nostrils flaring out sideways. Biggest difference for me is the fact that the new world monkeys have a prehensile tail, which means it grasps, where the old world monkeys have non-grasping. So their tails are just there for balance, as opposed to the new world monkeys, which can wrap their tail around a branch use it to suspend themselves and pull themselves back up. Big difference. Teeth are different, opposable thumbs, thumb in the same plane as the digits on the new world monkey where the old world monkeys are like us, except the colobus, which doesn't have this, and we'll talk about that just now. Um, ears are different, habitat pretty much changes because a lot of our monkeys in the old world have this ability to migrate between the trees and the ground where new world monkeys have a smaller range they're arboreal and generally have a tendency towards a single female and multi-male social groups where it is opposite for us here in africa where most of us have a single male and multi-female group with a little bit of different bits and pieces um food again varies but that's the basic breakdown. If we look at the options here, our old world monkeys are our gelada monkeys, which are up in Ethiopia. One day when I'm big, I'll get to see these. Black and white colobus and the red colobus, which we often see on our Uganda trips. Sometimes on some of our Kenya de destinations, you can see these black and white colobus. Chachma baboon, Southern Africa. Guinea, ba Guinea baboon, none of our trips. Olive baboon, also on our Uganda, Rwanda, 
East Africa trips all along there. Vervet monkeys, plentiful throughout the continent. Um, and you'll know a mandrel from something like Jungle Book, but we don't get to see these guys are more in Asia. Um, and then you have your New World monkeys, of which I have seen none of them outside of a zoo. So one day when I'm big, I'm going to go and visit and see some tamarins and marmosets and see some really cool spider monkeys and how they do it and hopefully hear a, a howler monkey one day. But these monkeys are pretty easy. The old world monkeys that we get to see, these are the vervet monkeys. This is in Uganda. Uh, we do a botanical garden walk before the trip just to stretch the legs. And they're very inquisitive and not a nuisance, which is not normal because when I lived in the lodges, these little guys were the biggest nuisance of all. They used to wait for people and then jump on their plates, steal their bread because they're sugar addicts. Like us, they have a sugar, sugar addiction. As soon as they figure out that their bread's got sugar or that there are sugar pots on the tables, they will raid and try and get that stuff as often as they can. And we used to have a little bit of fun with them because they have this alarm call that sounds like a... So whenever they see a predator, they're a great way for us to find a leopard or a lion or a cheetah because they've got incredible eyesight. And when they lock on, they'll give this alarm call. So when I was trying to keep them away from the bread on the tables, we used to shine and show an iPad with a leopard picture and that would freak them out enough to make them alarm call and stay away from our bread. But they're beautiful creatures. The baboons can be somewhat annoying this guy in particular he is a specific baboon and when we are driving down the road to get to the chimps in uganda he likes to stop traffic he will quite literally walk in front of the vehicle to make you stop then he will jump on and see if there's a window open that he can get into to try and steal some food and um, so there's some quite funny moments there but monkeys can be quite distributed, like our vervet monkeys, everything are very well distributed, lots of them. Something like this golden monkey, however, is a very different story. This monkey only occurs in Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda. And they live in these massive family groups, like 120 uh, multi-sex groups, where you have numerous um, dominant males, that then look over and cover all of the females and the females then stay within the group to protect their babies. And the breeding will be that if the females don't like it, they'll either leave and join another group or younger males, if they can't get hierarchy, will move to another group in order to get up and about. Baboons, on the other hand, have what we call an oligarchy. It is a numerous males, a handful of them, that will be dominant they will have all of the rights of covering the females and they have this strange thing where the females when they come into estrus chimps have it too their butts become heavily inflamed and red and they look quite revolting but apparently to the boys it is like dessert time they are in like flynn and they want it so when the ladies come past they will actually show off their butts to the dominant males who, if they like what they're seeing, will jump on board, do their bit for a couple of seconds, and then hop off and carry on. Some of the younger males have to learn those. So they will try with other females. If they get caught by one of those big males, they will be severely beaten. And what happens is like a hierarchy in a corporate structure, poop rolls downhill. And your highest ranking individuals will end up at the tops of the roosting tree at night because every night they will find or go to the same roosting tree these males will sit up at the top next the females and the youngsters will all be stuck at the bottom if somebody poops you may get pooped on in the night and they they too form this incredible role especially in southern africa and east africa where they're looking out for predators that incredible eyesight the vantage point of being in a tree looking out of the savanna they see a leopard lion or cheetah wild dogs even maybe hyenas they'll make a bow they'll make this very loud barking call 
which the other animals will understand as danger. And this works to their advantage. Everyone sticks close to them. But the moment the impala, the grants gazelles, the bushbucks, the smaller antelope drop their babies, they've been lured into this false sense of comfort. And these big baboons who have canines bigger than lions will jump in and steal and kill these babies to get a meaty return for the investment of keeping the rest of them safe during the other months. Here we have our colobus monkeys. These are black and white colobus, beautiful, beautiful monkeys. Love to be up in the trees. Not often that we get to be on eye level like this with them. And this little one was having super fun. And the word colobus comes from the Greek word of mutilated because they are missing an opposable thumb. And this makes it very difficult for them or different for them to be able to climb things. Apparently they don't have any problems climbing, but I can't imagine that it would be easy. Here we have those mutilated fingers here, missing the thumb. And this one is jumping between palm tree to palm tree. They literally leverage themselves off and launch and are still able to catch branches while this little one looks in horror going, mom, you better catch that branch. So good fun, the uh, overall feeling of these beautiful types of monkeys. Now to move on to our great apes. Now, I'm gonna jump back again to this diagram and you will see that then we go to old world monkeys get split off here and we move down to apes and humans. And we have our gibbons and out on this side and then we break away again down onto our own things now we have our orangutan which is about 97 percent the same uh, dna as what we have so here it breaks off at about 9 to 13 million years ago then we have gorillas which broke off probably at about 10 million years ago going up here humans and chimps then split from one another about six million years ago and then chimps then split into chimpanzees and bonobos and they then have their different pieces so our orangutan is seen as having about 97 percent the same dna as humans uh, gorilla is about 98 and chimpanzees and bonobos are around 99 percent but what's weird is that although on the average we are closer to chimps in terms of that overall, many of our individual gene genes are actually closer to gorillas. 15% of the human genome is closest to gorilla than to chimp, where 15% of chimp genome is actually closer to the gorillas. And this then leaves us in this point of who actually did what? I look at this diagram and go, did then the chimp further evolve beyond where we were and carry on and we just took different routes? But there are, chimps in general are just awesome. So for, for the moment, let me take you on a journey into the forest to see these beautiful creatures. <music>
amazing creatures and let's talk a little bit about chimps so we could get lost in this each one of these animals is worth the webinar on its own but chimps are very interesting like we were saying old world monkeys generally have a bigger female base than a male base and chimps in their infinite wisdom have the same but again that oligarchy this real political system where the males start to build up allegiances and they will fight as a group a political group to overthrow the current president and his cronies and his entourage and keep moving that along this is the current president at the moment and he's a beautiful male he actually was an orphan and because of this orphan nature he latched on to the bigger males he had to fend for himself and that hardiness actually gave him a little bit more oomph to get the job done and he's held on to this presidency beautifully chimps in general will then these males have to go around the territory and look or, or their home range because they don't have a specific territory but their home range to protect it against other communities coming in we call a group a community and this specific community that we visit when we go to kibali is 120 individuals strong it's a lot of chimps but they're never all together they're split up across their group and where it gets fascinating and we were talking about the baboons and how they mate is a female gets this big bulbous red bum which she then flaunts off to one of the males he'll mate with her and she'll move on in this case she will try and find the male that she wants to mate with she'll pull him aside they'll mate for a few days and then it's fair game for anyone all of these guys come in but she'll try and conceive early and she is mated with by all the different males to the point that they're trying their their penises have actually been adapted to try and remove other males sperm from inside her in order for his genetic to be passed on so it's this big genetic fight that's going on all the time they love to come down and relax but they're incredibly strong their muscle fibers are eight times denser than ours which means they are super strong and they are super intelligent the only reason why they don't fight with us is the fact that we're taller and that makes them think that we are stronger there's also time that has gone on that obviously has left them wondering about who is the bigger boss these guys move around and for the most part frugivores will eat a lot of fruit and um, they love it when it's fruiting season of different things they will though eat insects honey they've been known to get up and and pull honey out of beehives use sticks to pull ants and termites out of nests and one of the other tool making things that separates the higher apes what we call the higher intelligence apes is the tool of nesting creating a new nest every single night the males will create and the females will create their own little nests anything from about five feet up mostly higher in kibali to about 15 feet and then going all the way up to about 50 80 feet up that they will build these nests and they have these huge canines and when they're not eating 
bugs, fruit, and leaves, they're hunting. And they love to hunt those old world monkeys, specifically the red colobus monkeys. And they've devised this incredible thing. They'll use uh, sticks as spears, and they will get the youngsters to chase these guys through the trees, moving them, moving them, moving them, chasing them. And the males, I remember going, one year it was pouring with rain. They started hunting these colobus monkeys above us. The big males, all of the big males were down on the bottom, running past us, bumping our legs as they were trying to get in position because the youngsters, what they're doing is they're trying to rally the monkeys to a point where they have to make a jump. And sometimes the chimps on the other side will actually push a branch to what looks like in reach for the monkey that they can get away. And as soon as they launch, they will pull the branch back in order for the monkey to fall. And that's when these big boys then climb on top of it and they will share out the meat. In fact, on the last trip, we were following behind a group and they were moving, 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 moving. And they caught a diptych, which is, I mean, a daker, a red, a red daker, which is a small antelope which lives in these forests. And they caught this daker. And then the big president, he had the meat up at the top. He was holding on to it, eating. And as time went on, through the hierarchy, he gave meat out to the individuals who he was trying to keep close to him. And that political game was playing out all the time. Like I say, they're thinkers. They're constantly contemplating the world and watching what's going on. I love the chimps. So here's us walking. Welcome to Kibali Forest. We're in the rainforest. It's raining, go figure it out. What a cool experience. We're now gonna cruise through here to look for the chimps. It's a beautiful day, thunderstorm overhead. We're all well prepared with ponchos rain covers, all the rest, and we'll go see what the chimps are doing in this craziness. The rain's coming down harder and harder as we're going along. Just found some fresh chimpanzee down, and hopefully they're not too far away. The rain doesn't bode well for them being on the ground. These chimps between the rain are up in the trees. So it goes, we use what we use. And uh, we're going back to a fig tree now where we initially found them. There's some shouting from that side, so let's go see what they're doing. Yeah, they're coming down. Come with me, come with me. We managed to find them. Patients paid off. One of the males came down. He was cruising around. He put on a bit of a show for us, a yawn. Um, just watching a, a young female in a tree that walked up. She was trying to get to him, a bit more afraid of us. Males are definitely more habituated in that way. And uh, eventually she got around, he got around. They came together, quick mating session in the north. Now the sun's out. It's a beautiful afternoon in the, in the forest wet it smells amazing the sounds are amazing and we can head back towards lodge i just noticed how i had a big uh, red spot on my nose from a cocktail ant that liked to bite me that bites us from time to time these animals are also very rambunctious and noisy and it's one of the ways that we find them so enjoy the sounds the video work requires some uh, practice but we'll get there Enjoy the sound. So 
are very cool creatures, the chimps. Very closely related to us and, and something that when you look into their eyes, you really get a sense of things. And then the complete opposite, and the King Kong's given these guys such a bad name, is the gorillas. And the mountain gorillas, there's actually three different types of gorillas, three subspecies of gorilla. You have your um, mountain gorilla, your eastern lowland, and your western lowland. And in fact, the western lowland has also been broken off into another group. But we go see the mountain gorillas and seeing these guys in these slopes, in these areas where their numbers drop down to around 200 individuals and over the space of 30 years of ecotourism, the positive impact of having people and having a value to these animals has led to these guys getting to a incredible number of over 1,060 individuals with the next census probably looming next year or the following year. But each year, just in Rwanda alone, they're naming 20 to 30 new babies. So the growth rate is spectacular. And spending time with these animals is quite remarkable. The two little pockets where these animals occur, one being Bwindi Impenetrable National Park or Bwindi Impenetrable Forest, in Uganda, and the other being a area shared by Uganda, Rwanda, and the Congo being Volcanoes National Park, which runs along the base and over between five big volcanoes. And these guys have been split in terms of land usage because of the amount of people's subsistence farming in the areas. And because of the split, you have quite a big jump between the way that gorillas look. So these are our Ugandan gorillas. You can see this front part of the head is not so hairy. They're beautiful and big and powerful, whereas the Rwandan ones have this much denser fur, thicker hair, and this little red patch that's going on here. And this is because in Rwanda, they've been forced to higher levels than what the Ugandan ones have. Also, the diet of the two groups are different in the fact that the Rwandan, the Volcanoes National Park area there, they eat no fruit. They eat a lot of greens, a lot of the uh, stinging nettles, thistles, uh, all sorts of different plants. They'll occasionally eat the safari ants, which are biting ants that gave the word for ants in your pants because you dance when they get in there. And um, the Ugandan ones eat a lot more fruit and they'll climb up into trees. So actually on this day, we had to wait for them to come down a fig tree and come join us so that we could see them and be part of their situation. Once they'd stopped feeding, they then settled down had a little bit of rest time. Now, because their numbers are growing and their forest has dwindled, that has left them a little bit at a bad position for genetics. Because as much as they're coming back, the smaller that area, the more inbreeding that occurs. So this silverback here, he is a silverback of a family called Rushaguru which is one that I love to go see. It's a beautiful family of about 18 gorillas. And they live in families where there is one dominant silverback. There can be multiple silverbacks. Silverback only refers to ones that have reached 12 and are over. They get the silver color in their back. I've got a little bit of salt in my paper too. I'm turning into a silverback fast. But these guys rule the roost. And the big man is the big man. I've seen a family with five different silverbacks. The others are submissive to him. Yes, they will still be naughty like people and sneak off around a corner to try and sneak a quickie and get their genetics out. If they do not feel that is possible, they will then leave the family and try and search for a new family. And this is how this genetic mixing has gone. But this guy has been in power for so long and he has so little competition that he has started having inbreeding problems with one of his kin and giving out babies that have this blonde complexion that don't make it past a year. This little one died about four months after 
we saw it and that was very unfortunate since he's she's had another one of these babies and previous she had another one so there's three recorded there <clears throat> and i'm still trying to get down to the full understanding of what is happening but being in these little islands means that this genetic pot is not being stirred very well and it would have been better having all that forest in between because you would have had these males moving between now with this these two islands of animals and their physical characteristics and their feeding characteristics is very likely that these two are already subspecies of one another which has not officially been written down why we don't know maybe it's for conservation purposes that you split them you suddenly put them in a horrible space of where does the money go to uganda or rwanda which is not a nice argument to have but the experience of being around these guys Again, Rwandan ones, you can see how much furrier and buffier they are. And this one's eating those thistles that I was talking about. There's a lot of liquid inside there. They break it, they strip it, and they eat the fiber inside. And the experience of being with these guys is second to none. So this was Bob's brush with death. Oh, this is just a nice compilation of a lot of gorillas. Okay. You'll now see just how close this one was coming. So this is the other angle for my GoPro. Now, during these times, this looks great and it's amazing to get this close. But there's a lot of work that goes into it. A habituation of a gorilla family takes at least two years to do. The gorillas don't want us around because they're afraid of us. They think we're going to try to kill them like we've killed so many of the other kin. But after that two-year period and moving on, they actually start to relax. So here is the second in charge of the Sabino family. And this was Bob's brush report. We will soon figure out who Bob is. Look at the size of that guy. What an experience. So, on to our last primate. And we have all been told about our evolutionary movement from one, and as we stood up and we entered the field, we grew and changed. But the actual way that all of this has played itself out, the further we go down is one, there's not a lot of fossil evidence of primates. So trying to link us all together, maybe because of our size and softer bones, we were eaten up and those fossils were lost. But we figured that there actually were multiple hominid species that erupted at the same time. And because of this eruption, we then killed off our kin or any competing tribes from Homo naledi to Homo habilis to Homo sapien to, we've got multiple, multiple, multiple different types. And the most recent find was a find of 1,550 bones called Homo naledi, not more than about 35 minutes drive from where I sit right now and just outside of Johannesburg. And there's a group of caves caves there called the Stagfontein Caves where they have found other um, homo species. Um, Miss Pless was found here and our South African archaeologist 
was in competition with Richard Leakey up in Kenya and Tanzania, who had found Australopithecus up that side. But some cavers in 2013 went through some pretty intense little spaces and got down to this Dinaledi chamber. Naledi means star because it's the rising star cave, and <clears throat> they think this is a very close piece of history. And I want to show you what these guys did to get into this cave. Now, this is some serious guts. How do you put yourself through a hole that big for the first time, not knowing if you can get out? Look at this guy. That was the hole they had to get through. He's, the man is, is hopelessly insane. So let me just pause that again. They climbed through this tiny little hole here to get into this cave, and they found these bones then. They immediately knew that there was something that was amiss, so they called in the, the troops, and they'd been searching and scouring these caves for a long time, and they actually had to scout out for smaller female archaeologists to be able to get into this hole to then do all the collection of these things, and this is what we think Homo naledi looked like. And what's fascinating is this access to this cave is so small, finding 15 different individuals from infants through adults in this cave, and then a further 130 pieces of bone 100 meters, 300 feet deeper in, make us wonder as to why they went down there. They had smaller brains than us. They were sitting at about four and a half to five feet tall, smaller brains, more like the size of a gorilla. And they went into these dark caves. Now, either they were going in there and they had to have the benefit of fire to see where they were going, or they were forced in there by predators, or they were purposely getting in there to throw bones in there, which could already point to the idea of understanding a deity or having a thought of a deity, which is quite mind boggling on its own. And I like to leave you with that point based on the fact that this was aged back. These guys were aged back to about 300,000 years ago. So Sunny, I'm ready for questions when you are. Richard, thank you so much. I just love hosting when you are presenting and uh, you did not disappoint. Your passion for this subject is so clear and so contagious. So thank you very much. Um, we've got lots of questions. Um, let's start with some straightforward ones. What do lemurs eat? Most of them eat le it will eat leaves, um, fruit, things like indri, this, the, the biggest extent one. Is it's interesting because they'll eat a lot of different types of leaves and then they'll come down and they'll actually have to eat clays in order to balance out the, the toxins in those leaves. But each one has a specific niche from the eye eye, which eats insects, to ringtails, which will eat fruit and insects, to woolly lemurs, which will also be frugivores and insectivores, to mouse lemurs, which are insectivores. So it's mainly along those lines. There's no meat, meat eaters amongst the lemurs in terms of their bigger, like catching a bigger animal and pulling it down. Their only predator that will really chase after them is a fusa, which is a cat-like creature, more closely related to something like a civet or a, um, a genet, and they can run down trees. They'll also be caught by snakes, will catch them and birds will control their numbers. Mm. Um, You've mentioned that monkeys are addicted to sugar, just like us. Was there a specific species you were thinking of or monkeys in general? M monkeys and anyone, any monkey that has got close enough to human habitation 
has an affliction to going for sugar, 100%. Baboons, we, I even know a baboon that loved um, tomato cocktails specifically, and he would break into the bar and steal all the tomato cocktail because he had an affinity for that. The vervet monkeys, most definitely. Um, the golden monkeys love to go out into the farmer's fields. They steal the uh, potatoes, again, very high in that carbohydrate, sugar rich stuff. They don't often get to sugar, sugar, but around the lodges specifically, you will find these guys stealing sugars and things like breads to get that sugar. Hmm. Do you have a guess as to why there are so few ape species? If we look at the one, the size and the space, the great apes would have had to contend with other things in the area. And in order to get to that point with any pyramid of evolution or even a food pyramid, the food pyramid always ends in a point. You cannot have all of these highly intelligent creatures and have thousands of them because they would wipe out everything underneath them. And humans are the greatest example of that. We know that there were seven, six or seven different hominid species that we have. Neanderthal, Homo erectus, Homo ledii. Um, you, as we go along, there's all these Homo species that were around. And we killed all of them off because that top of the pyramid was too cluttered. So the great apes would be managed by that interaction with other great apes. There's just not enough space for all of us. Hmm. What would cause a gorilla to attack a human? So the silverback that I was referring to, the leader of the family, the one who looks after everyone, the family are fiercely strongly bonded to one another. And if someone attacks an animal within the group, every single one of those other gorillas will give their life to save that one. So us going into their territory is a, is a big part of it. And I, I'll recount a story from last year. <clears throat> I was out with one of NatHab's filmmakers and we had gone off after the group had left we went back to Uganda to do a habituation trek. And a habituation trek entails spending four hours with a family that is not as used to people as the habituated families. And we get this very skewed idea of what it is like to meet a gorilla in the wild when you are with a habituated family because they will walk past you. One of our ladies last year had her pants torn because one of the blackbacks gripped her leg and pulled the pants and tore her leg she was happily flashing everyone with a smile on her face because she'd been manhandled by a gorilla. But in this habituation trek, it's very different. It was the first time I'd had a chance to experience it. And we got there, and again, I've done this many, many, many times, and I'm happy to go back many, many more times. But this was the first time with a family that wasn't so comfortable with people. When we pulled in, as we got to within 150 feet of these animals, they started to move away. The guides were trying to get us close, and I just said to the guys, listen, we're not in a hurry. We have four hours. We have already done four treks for the video stuff. We get nothing, and we're just here. That's cool. And after about an hour and a half, they let us start getting closer. So we started to get within 40, 50 feet of these animals. And the filmmaker, Andrew, stepped out and around a tree, unbeknownst there was a baby behind there and the baby gave off this shrill shriek. And the next thing, the entire family came bearing down on us. The noise was crazy. I just sat there going, holy crap.
and it was real. It was really weird that whole system was to see that the bank very close to them, but it takes time. You still there, Sunny? Oh yes. Uh, sorry, yeah. it, it was cutting out a little bit. So I was just about to uh, say, are you are you finished with that response? Which I yeah. think you are. Yeah. You can, okay. No, you <laughs> we have a wonderful we have a wonderful thing in South Africa called load shedding, and my power <laughs> has just been turned off for hours, so that affects my signal somewhat. Well, it was such a captivating story. I, I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> um, why do they not reuse their nests? Because they move, so they'll move off and do other things. Secondly, because most of the time they poop in them, so it's not quite sanitary, so they'll move off and create a new one, and it takes all of 30 seconds to a minute to create a new nest. They grab branches, they pull it over, and pull it in and drop it down, and everything works beautifully from that point. Mm. Well, Richard, that's the last question we have time for today, but we've got several comments suggesting there might be interest for a part two. There's just a lot more um, to learn and um, we just will yeah. take anything you give us as far as your passion. So please consider a part two. Um, let me just no turn problem. it back to you for closing comments. Thank you everyone for tuning in and thanks for sharing in this beautiful platform and thank you for NetHab creating a nice sounding board and, and place for us to to share this information with everyone and thanks Sunny for hosting and we'll see you all next week I'll be back for some more Lightroom tutorials and answering your questions sounds good thanks to everybody who tuned in today please join us again tomorrow for our next daily dose of nature you can check out this week's lineup including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars we did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.